I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like your effort wasn't paying off? Like there must be something wrong with you. Like no matter how hard you try, it just doesn't seem to be returning the dividends you were looking for. The return on investment just isn't there. By the end of today's talk, my hope is that you would learn how your effort to get good has hurt you from getting good. That our inability to actually use everything we have to gain could be hurting us in the long run. I don't know about you, but I love competitive games. I am a competitive gamer. It's just the way it is. Some may not say that because I'm bad at it, but hey, I am a competitive gamer. I love the competition. I like, I like, it just moves me. It makes me drive forward. I will never, ever, ever be a runner. And I, I don't mean that I'll never run. But I'll never be like a runner, someone that likes to like compete against their own time. You know what I mean? Just go out there and they're just like trying to like, oh, I ran, to, I ran this mile in, in seven minutes and then I run it in six. But that's not me. But if you tell me, hey, TJ, I got this thing for you. You know, I got this race and there's going to be 10 other people on the line. I'm there. That's my kind of place to be. That's my setting. I want to win. I don't know where it comes from but it is a deep desire for me to win. I love the competition. And sometimes it's not even about the winning. It's just about the actual event of competing. I love it. I love it with everything in me. But in my old age, specifically when it comes to video games, I am slowing down. I am 33 years old. I know, I know. Still look this good. Still look this good, you know. But uh, 33 years old. And I've realized that I'm slowing down. Like half the time I freeze in critical moments. Like what my younger 16-year-old self would have been like snapping headshots. I'm like aiming in and I'm trying to I'm like and then I'm dead. And I'm just like, what what are you doing? And I, I have to I have to like coach myself out of it. Like, like daylight, like. Just shoot immediately. And, you know, people around me and, and you know, that are they're playing games, I mean, they're always like, no, it, it, you're lining up your shot. You know, you're trying to make the best shot. No, I'm not. I am not moving fast enough. If I would just put shots down range, I would be able to get the kills. I'd be able to win the game. I'm freezing. And I see it. I see it in my head sometimes. After I'll die, I'll be like, what was I doing? I'm slowing down. But the competitor in me believes wholeheartedly, like wholeheartedly, that I can entry frag and 1v5 in Valorant. You know what I mean? I could just pop in there with Jet and kill everyone. I really believe that with my whole heart. Or uh, I can just, you know, squash an entire team and see us go. Or Rainbow Siege. Just run in. I just run and gun. And they're all dead. Easy. I really believe that I can do that. I believe that I could lobby wipe in Tarkov, that I can go in there and kill everybody in the lobby. Never done it, but I believe I can do it. Or that I can be a level down in League of Legends and still 1v5 and get a pentakill by myself, solo. Trust me, I've put it to the test many times at my team's detriment. Seriously though, somewhere in this dumb brain of mine, <laughs> I have this innate belief that I can do these things. Even though my skill has shown that I can't. So I try over and over and over again. I'll train aim trainers, man. I'll watch YouTube videos of the pros doing it. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm getting it. I'm getting this knowledge. I'm getting better. But it always seems that all of that information, all of that training builds up in me something that doesn't pay off. It almost instills in me a false confidence because the, the whole thing is, is I'm not necessarily getting worse. I'm playing the game 
that was designed a certain way, the wrong way better. <laughs> like, like I am literally practicing the wrong way to play the game. And you'd be like, whoa, whoa. You mean listening to the pros, aim training, that's all good things. And I would agree with you if I was applying that to the way those games were meant to be played. The problem is, is I'm not playing the games correctly. All of the games I just mentioned are designed to be team games. That's the whole point of them. But in every example I gave, it was about me. It was about my ability. It was about improving myself. And I do believe that you need to be a strong team member, right? That you should train yourself to be a good part of the team. But I wasn't training for that. I was training so that I could get better. So that I could do it myself. And that's not how the game works. Instead of relying on teamwork and coordination like the games are meant to be, I focused on my ability to solo 1v5. But just like in the game of life, I wasn't designed to live it by building myself up. I wasn't designed to live this life in such a way that I solo better. As much as you might think and as much as culture might have has, has, has poured into you, you're not meant to be the master of your vessel. The greatest I've ever felt in my life is when I've realized that in this game of life, That when I stop and I give up the parts of me, the whole of me, to the Lord, that I start to win. And it is hard. That is a hard, hard thing to master, to understand. Because it's really not mastering your ability to get better. It's mastering your ability of submission. What? What do you mean? Like, how do you master like getting weaker, right? How, how do you master laying your life down? Well, I hope that the sermon today helps you understand that a little bit better. I hope that you take the tenets of what we're going to speak about today and you apply them to your life. Because in this game of life, it's a team game. It's you and all the Christians around you. It's you and all the people that need to know about Jesus. And most of all, and the greatest player on your team is God. As we look at Luke 9 today, I want you to start thinking about and looking through this scripture verse and applying your life in such a way through the phrase, success through submission. Type it in the chat right now. I want to know that you're paying attention. Are you with me right now? Success through submission. If you can learn that your success is not through tearing down everybody else's building, it's not about building the biggest tower, it's not, it is about learning how to submit your will and your way to the Lord, it'll change foundationally every single thing about you. It'll strengthen your relationships. It'll strengthen your mental health. It will push you towards physical health. And most of all, it'll give you direction that is not guided by you, but guided by someone that understands the game of life a little bit better. Jesus. So we're going to snap into Luke 9, 37 through 43. Before we get into this, let me do a summary real quick. You know how I like to do this. I want to make sure you understand what's going on, especially when we weren't here, you know, the last, the last week when we were talking about um, the Mount of Transfiguration and so on and so forth. So Jesus and his boys, they're doing some stuff, all right? Right now, they, they just got down from a mountaintop experience. And what I mean by that is 
Jesus brought three of the apostles up on top of the Mount and he was like, and they fell into a deep sleep. We're talking our boy, Peter, our boy, John and James. These are the three that got to go up there and do their thing. When Jesus was on the mountaintop, somehow, some way, some shape, form, the prophet Elijah came and Moses came. I don't know if we call him a prophet Moses because he, he did a lot of things. We'll just say Moses. Moses came and it says that Jesus literally had a transfiguration moment that he was being seen in his glory. His clothes turned white, his face shone, so on and so forth. So in that moment, they were on that mountaintop. We are now at the part where they came down off of the mountaintop. This is important to understand because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain something in a minute. So now we're here. This is what's happening. In verse 37, it says, The next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met them. Just then a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son because he's my only child. That's a really important thing. A spirit seizes him. Suddenly he shrieks and it throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth, severely bruising him. It scarcely ever leaves him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Jesus replied, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. In verse 42, as the boy was still approaching, the demon knocked him down and threw him into severe convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all astonished at the greatness of God. A lot happening here. Come down the, to, the, to the, the mountain. Boom, huge crowd. Always Jesus is getting like berated by people. He is, that's modern day paparazzi. And the crowds of like, you know, trying to get the signature off of, you know, fill in famous influencer here. But there's a man that comes through and he has a child who is stricken. He's, according to the scriptures, demonically possessed. He's having these crazy episodes. And Jesus' boys couldn't handle it. And you can see what Jesus says to him when he says, you know, this perverse generation, how long do I have to deal with you? And so when we look in verse 37, when it says, the next day when they come down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. Have you ever came back from an amazing experience? Like I used to have this happen to me a lot when I was a teenager because I would go to like teen camp and it was like this Christian camp and it was a ton of fun. Like I absolutely loved him. But I would have these experiences with God because I was spending so much time with him and my mind was focused in on God. Where I'd go to a convention or I'd go to a conference or any type of long, uh, prolonged experience to really giving up to the Lord. And when I did that, I would come back from these things fired up. Like I was changed because I was changed. In those moments I was spending with the Lord, he was teaching my heart. He was changing me. And when you've spent time like that and you step back into the real world, where there's people that are grumpy, people that might be still frustrated with life, overwhelmed. They haven't had the same experience. It can be frustrating. It can be like heart intact. Like you could feel like, what is going on? Like what, why are you guys being like this? Because you're feeling a certain way, you know, you've been on that mountaintop experience and then you're coming back to like, this is what I'm dealing with. And that's because the crash from the mountaintop to the valley is a long way down. And in Jesus's ministry, 
this mountaintop experience was probably the top of the line, right? Saw the risen Moses and Elijah, saw in his glory. This is a huge experience. And I believe Jesus was ready to conquer the world. And then he comes down to this crowd of people that are just lost. He comes down to the fact that his disciples can't even do the simplest tasks because of a lack of their faith. It's interesting the contrast too, right? One second, God is with Elijah and Moses in this spiritual state, in this mountaintop experience, and then now he's with a lunatic at, at the bottom of the valley. And I believe this is such an interesting thing because the contrast shows really the roller coasters of life. And it shows that, that the mountaintop experiences that we have in our own life and then the sudden realities sometimes that we're faced with by living in a sinful, fallen world. In verse 38, it says, Just then a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son because he's my only child. That's important because if he's his only child, it is the only way for his line to, his succession to happen. And that was very, very, very important to so many people in the ancient world that my name will be carried on, that I will have some sort of lineage to come. The Jews actually understood one of the greatest things that they could do in life was to create healthy lineage that creating a space for their children to be successful and healthy and grounded in God was so important. And that was actually the top thing on your list. And so this man is getting plagued with the fact that his child is demonically possessed and no one seems to have the answer. In verse 39, a spirit ceases him. Suddenly he shrieks and it throws him into convulsion. Till he foams at the mouth, severely bruising him, it scarcely ever leaves him. If any of you know someone that has epileptic seizures, epileptic seizures, you've seen this before. Many scholars have looked at this and they believe that he was having seizures. But these weren't just medical seizures. This was being brought on by this demonic force that was living in him. And the reason we know that it wasn't just simply a medical issue is the fact that it says Jesus cleansed him of the unclean spirit and then healed him. So there's two things that had to happen there. The spirit could leave, but that doesn't mean he was healed. He had to be healed as well. I find that interesting because oftentimes I don't think we realize the severity that the demonic can influence you. And we've talked a little bit, little bit about this a couple months ago. But the beautiful thing is, is that Jesus, in his ministry, and in his ministry into your life, completely covers you. He has you. He's healed you. He protects you. He's for you. And this child got to experience that freedom. In verse 40, it says, I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. The disciples had some previous success of casting out demons. It literally says in Luke 9, 1. They were going around and they were, you know, releasing people from, um, from this oppression and this possession so like, what was it in this, 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 this exact case? Like what, what was their issue? Some scholars believe that 
it may be that this demon was a little stronger. That was a little more stubborn. And there's a case for that idea through Ephesians 6.12 where there's a hierarchy. Just like there's a hierarchy of angels, there's a hierarchy of demons, I guess. And so evidently, because of that, there's, there's some demons that are stronger, more stubborn, resistant. I don't know. But really where we get a true understanding of why they couldn't release this boy from this episode, from this problem, from this possession, was because it shows us in Matthew 17, 21. And this is a the, uh, the exact same story in Luke that's translated over also to Matthew. It says in Matthew 17, 21, Jesus said that their failure was due to a lack of prayer and fasting. It isn't that prayer and fasting makes us worthier to cast out demons. That's not how that works. What it does mean, though, is that the idea is that prayer and fasting draw us closer to the heart of God and put us more in line with his power. We become less so that he can become more. If you want to be used in the power of God, you have to be trained in his presence. This whole idea makes me constantly think of, and I don't know why this always comes to my head, but the hyperbolic, the hyperbolic time chamber in Dragon Ball Z, like they would go in for three days and it would be like a year or something. It always makes me think of that because that really is what it's like when we spend time in the presence of God. We are being trained up in such a way. It's a, it's like a cheat code, right? The hyperbolic chamber was just like, it was like a cheat code. Anytime, anytime that Goku couldn't defeat a villain, he would just step in there and be like, but that's exactly what Jesus would do. He went away on the mountaintop. He would go away for 40 days and pray and fast. It would make make exponential gains because something is different when you're spending time with the Lord. See, the difference in the hyperbolic time chamber is like, you're not taking this time to, you know, lift weights and train. You're not trying to improve yourself. Really what you're learning is the more that you come to know Jesus, the less you become and the more he becomes. He becomes more present in you. He becomes the first answer. Your fleshly answer, right? That answer that you want to give because you're mad, you're angry. The, the, that answer that comes from the negative, from the sin inside of you, instead starts to come from the words of God. And so when you're made fun of or, or you're, you're, you're annoyed, or what spurs from you and spews out of you when you've spent time in the hyperbolic chamber that is the presence of God, what comes out of you is the fruit of the Spirit. What comes out of you is goodness. But it's not because you're being built up in the way that you would think. You're not gaining more muscles. You're not gaining more armor. or sort. What you're instead doing is you're losing more things. You're emptying yourself out. We think that power means we gain to win. But in reality, it's about learning how to lose to gain. Because when we shed off the things in us, when we loose, loose those things, we gain the goodness of God. We gain God in us. Culture would tell you that if you want to get stronger, if you want to get better, if you want to do ministry more, if you want to be a better talker to people, like it would tell you to do all of these things. You know, if I was to write you up some map, some system, some schedule, it would look like get up and I want you to train 50 you know, times and saying the gospel, learn your testimony in under a minute. Do it's so much simpler than that. And I'm not saying those things are bad. What I'm telling you is that there is a also better answer. 
And I'm telling you, maybe when you spend time with God, he'll direct you to give you the most efficient way to build the spiritual muscle in you. The Bible tells us our power is instead about losing. Losing what holds us back. Losing the things that separate us from Jesus. We need to learn how to stop holding on to disbelief. Stop holding on to comfortability. Stop holding on to the things we put before God that separate us from him. And when we step into his presence and we make a living sacrifice that we choose to pick up our cross and we empty ourselves, it leaves and makes room for him to move. Prayer and fasting, right? Prayer means we sacrifice our time, our pride, our control. It literally teaches us how to bridle ourselves. And the ones that's in the in, in the spiritual in control of the spiritual reins becomes God. Because I know this, when I am in control and I am in control of the reins, what tends to happen is the worst of the worst scenario, right? I end up trying to 1v5 in a team game that's not meant to have that done. Is it possible? For sure. Is it best? No. Does it often lead to failure, heartache, broke? Absolutely. The simple, the simple act of prayer, just entering into prayer, talking with God, in and of itself is an act of submission. Without you ever saying a word. Because when you choose to stand before God and you bear witness to his existence, you're already submitting your doubt. You're already taking a step towards saying, Obviously, there's something bigger than me here. Which is a step towards submission. I've often heard the excuse, oh man, I can't pray, I have ADHD. Or no, I can't pray, I can't focus. I have ADHD, full blown. And what I learned through the exercise of simply giving and setting time away to be with God is that he still begins to work even when I'm unfocused. He still does things in my life even when I didn't maximize my prayer time. Even when I made mistakes and got distracted. The simple exercise of setting some time just say, Lord, I'm going to be with you. 20 minutes, I could have been in my head. Just who knows what's going on. But the two minutes, the three minutes, the five minutes, the 10 minutes that he got my attention, I was being renewed and refreshed. There is no substitute and there's nothing so wrong with you that you cannot pray. Don't let that excuse mess up your ability to gain what you cannot lose. And to lose what you cannot gain. Fasting means we sacrifice our wants, our desires, and even further, fasting means you're sacrificing your needs. You'd be like, whoa, hey, wait a second, wait a second, daylight. I can't sacrifice my needs. It's literally what God told us to do, right? When you give up food, you're sacrificing something, a need for your sustenance to live. That's pretty incredibly crazy. But it's a beautiful sacrifice because it teaches and it trains our soul and our body that we aren't the masters of this vessel, but God is. Water will sustain you in this life. Food will sustain you in this life. But God says that I am the wellspring of eternity. 
I give you eternal life. Disclaimer. That does not mean stop drinking, eating food, and be like, I'm sacrificing for God. What it does mean is start to imply and apply fasting into your life. Sacrificing your desires and your wants and your needs for the Lord. These things empty us and create spiritual space for God to use us. You literally clean out the proverbial closet in your soul so that the Lord can store the things in you that you need to have available. I don't know about you, but some mess- there's some, some closets that can get messy. There's some scarves that can get thrown under your desk. In verse 41, Jesus replied, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. In verse 42, as the boy was still approaching, the demon knocked him down and threw him into severe convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all astonished at the greatness of God. Jesus says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Remember when I was talking about that spiritual high moment, right? Coming from that mountaintop experience to the valley and how like frustrating it can be. I think Jesus is experiencing that. I think he's frustrated that he's like, how can you not get it? Like, I don't have much time left here, and you're, you're still, like, your lack of faith is evident. His season of ministry was coming to an end, and the cross was very, 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 very close. And he's poured himself out and poured himself out, and he's not reaping the effort for his work. It's frustrating. Jesus still uses this moment, though, to teach. In that Matthew verse 17, in chapter 17, it talks about that idea of like, really came from a question. The disciples were like, why didn't it work for us? And Jesus was able to explain to them it was the prayer and fasting. And so it was a teaching moment for them to understand that this power isn't just willy-nilly, that it's not just like flipping, but that it takes being in his presence. As he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed the boy. Even when the father brought the boy to Jesus, at first he did not seem to get better, but the problems showed themselves as bad as ever. This was the last desperate attempt of the possessing demon to hold on to that boy and cast that father, those disciples, all into despair. In the original language, that idea of throwing him down is the same idea and and the way that it's talked about delivering a final blow, the knockout punch. That thing that would end him. And Spurgeon sums this up really great. Spurgeon talks about this idea that usually when people are on the cusp of freedom, when they're starting to work themselves towards faith, when they're starting to work themselves towards understanding who Jesus is, it seems on the, the, the attacks on their life become so much more immense. And he says it like this, I have seen men just when they were beginning to hear and beginning to think, taken on a sudden with such violence of sin and so fearfully carried away by it, 
that if I had not seen the same thing before, I should have despaired of them. If you're today questioning this idea of, hey man, I've heard you talk maybe for a few weeks, maybe for a few months, like you've been around, but you've never really taken your faith seriously. And you're going through some stuff. Don't let it beat you up. Don't let it put you off the path on which you're heading towards. But instead, take it as a sign that those things that you're battling towards, that Jesus you're trying to understand and believe in, is real. And he loves you and he has a plan for your life. And there are forces that do want to keep you away from him. And it's as simple as giving your heart to him. It's as simple as saying, Jesus, I'm going to submit to you. I'm, I'm going to give this a shot, God. I'm going to put my faith in you and, and see where it takes me. I know that I've messed up. I know that I've, I've done some things that I'm not proud of. Because what will start getting spoken into you is that God didn't pick me. He wouldn't choose me. Trust me, you don't know. You haven't seen. You haven't seen who I am. You'll start to play the doubt of. I'm too big of a sinner. Trust me, man. Like the desires in this heart are evil. The lie of like it's too late for me. I've messed up too many times. That lie of there's there's no use anymore. And you start to hear that voice that's telling you to give up. That you'll never get it correct. Or another voice that might be like, this won't work for you. You're different than those people. This won't. Trust me. And when those doubts come in, God is waiting. All you have to do is answer the door. He's waiting. And the love of Jesus and the beautiful relationship that you can have with your creator is honestly so difficult to put into words of the immense change it's made in my life. And the immense changes I've seen it make in so many other people's lives. Because the Bible is a love story between you and God. And it's watching us walk away and spit in God's face and him still open up his arms and find whatever way, shape, or form he can muster to bring you home. That's the beauty that is the gospel. And it's not too late for you. You are worthy. You are valuable. You're valuable simply because you're his. This is for you. Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. He healed the child not intimidated by the last display of that knockout punch. Jesus delivered the demon-possessed boy instantly. What was too hard for the disciples was not too hard for Jesus. What's too hard for you to deal with in your life is not too hard for Jesus. Submission to success. Find your, your success through submission. I want to pray for you. And then I'll uh, turn it over to Solux. But take some time and think about how much time you're giving over to the Lord. Take some time and think about 
Are you just trying to fight through this life? Or are you learning how to live success through your submission to him? Let's pray. Jesus, you are beautiful. You are worthy. And God, our hearts often run astray. We have desires in us, God, that are not of you. And Lord, as long as we are living life for ourselves, as long as we are living life trying to build up to be the person that we, that we wish we were, God, we will never obtain it until we learn how to submit to you. I pray for each and every heart in this in this place, God, whether it be on Twitch right now, God, or on YouTube or one of our other social media platforms, God, I just pray you touch the listener. Their heart would be changed and they would come to know you in a beautiful way. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen and amen. Amen. I love you guys. I really do. If no one's told you they love you today, we here at God's Squad Church, we love you. And I'll see you soon. I feel so loved. Thanks, TJ. <laughs> um, that was amazing. I hope you guys were blessed by that. I hope you feel God speaking to you right now. Uh, I know I definitely do. And I was just thinking, like, story, she takes people out into the wilderness to go out with nothing to just get closer to God. And I was like, I need that in my life. And then I realized, wait, I've already had that in my life. It's like, what am I doing right now? So this was good. Also, he, t Pastor Daylight, he said, um, when you throw your scarves under the desk, I feel like that was solely for me <laughs> and I'm like no one else is going to understand they're like scarves under the desk what but I had all these scarves like Bryn likes to play with them so they were just piled back here so I quickly threw them under the desk so you guys wouldn't see and it looks like my room's all clean but it's a disaster under my desk so <laughs> that was funny too um but yeah thank you so so much if any of you want to make that choice to to follow Jesus whether you feel like you haven't really done it and today you want to do it, you want to rededicate your life, today's your first time in any way or shape or form, you think, all right, I want to follow Jesus today. Go ahead and let us know in the chat so we can celebrate with you. If you're too shy, shy that's okay. We still want to celebrate with you because it is the best decision you could ever make. This life feels so lonely without God because we're supposed to be doing it with God, with our creator. And so um, that loneliness will definitely go away once you realize he's there. So um, yeah, we're, we're so excited for those of you who made this decision. Um, I also encourage you guys, if you wanna make that decision to put exclamation point connect in the chat, it will bring up a connect form that you can fill out. That way we can know that you made this decision. If you don't want to make it a huge public thing, you just want to let us know and we will reach out to you, see if you have any questions, how we can help you with this journey um, and just share our excitement and do life together, you know? So be sure to take advantage of that form. And um, I also want you to know, we do a couple things around here to help you in your growth with God. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of things. Just getting into our Discord and being around our community is one. But we also have XP groups. They're small groups where you get to know groups of small, smaller people that you can communicate with. Um, we have serve teams, another great way to get to know people. I know my media team, we don't just do media tasks together. We ask each other questions about life and we share in life together. Uh, we have water baptisms. If you just made that decision, you can get water baptized online. It's, it's amazing. So um, you can put exclamation point baptism to sign up for those. We have something called XP path where you can learn what are my next steps? How, what is my purpose? 
how do I maybe partner with the church to make sure that we can reach more people? Like I have been touched by Jesus. I want to make sure other people are touched by Jesus. We have so many, so many different things. Um, check out all the links in the chat if you want more information or to sign up for any of those. And then next we are going to enter a time of giving. Uh, this is a time where we believe it's it's just another form of worship. We give all of ourselves to God. And one of those things is our finances because we have been given everything by God. So he gave us all of our finances, anything we happen to have. And now we want to give some of it back. We're not asking for all of it, of course, but maybe just a little bit of it to further what God might have in store for his kingdom through the work of GSC. So if you would love to help us out, be a part of this, we have a couple of ways that you can give. You can either go to godsquadchurch.com slash giving. That is specifically our website. It's where you can do that. You can right here on Twitch, click the link below. Um, and then if you reside in the US, you can text the number 84321 any amount and it will start giving you um, directions on how to give. So again, pull out your phones if you're in the US, text 84321. And then we are so grateful for you guys for anything that you give. We take it very seriously here. Um, we want to further this church. We want to further anything that God might have in store for this church and the people it reaches. And it's all for God's glory. And may his will be done. So thank you. And thank you. Thank you for partnering with us in this way.